Hi, I'm Catherine. I'm Teresa. And we are the co-authors of the book, Pass the Baton, Empowering All Music Students. Our goal is to share stories of educators who are passing the baton and empowering their music students. We want to help teachers create music lessons that transform students from passive consumers to vibrant creatives. All right, so we're joined today by Laura Johnson. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Laura last summer at the Women Band Directors International Conference, which of course was held online, but we've connected a couple times since then. So I'm really excited to have her here. So thank you, Laura, for joining us. Thank you for having me, I'm excited. Um, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit and maybe tell us about uh, your current teaching position. Sure, so, um, before moving to Virginia, which is where I am now, I was in Minnesota. I taught middle school band in central Minnesota at a small school. Then I moved out here to Norfolk, Virginia, got my master's at Old Dominion University in music education with a conducting concentration. And then I was one of those people that decided, you know, a pandemic is a perfect time to jump back in the classroom and take a new position, which looking back i don't know what i was thinking it's going great but that was a decision that was made so i took a position as a band director at a title one middle school here in southeastern virginia and it has been a wild ride but very thankful to be where i am that's awesome i love it so last summer you presented on um, using student selected repertoire in your music programs can you tell us a little bit more about that Yes, absolutely. So this was a process that I first experienced as a high school student. So anytime I talk about this, I try to give a shout out to my high school band director, Matt Donnell, because he's the one who first provided this opportunity for me and then I took it and used it in my own classrooms as well. So when I entered the classroom for the first time as a teacher, I took a look at the repertoire selection process and I wanted to see how I could involve my students because I loved being involved when I was in their shoes. And I feel really strongly about this process and about involving students in that choice because for the most part, teachers select repertoire that they think their students will like based on what they know about their students and their backgrounds and their preferences. And it's important, of course, that we as the teachers are the ones making a lot of these decisions. We are the experts. We have education and some guidance on how to make repertoire choices that will best serve our students. But instead of us just assuming what students like, and instead of that, what if we just allowed our students to choose at least some of what they're playing? Not all. I'm, every time I speak about this, I say, I'm not saying give your students the reins and let them program all of your concerts. No, <laughs> we know that's not the move, but let, letting them have some say in what they perform. So with that, I implemented a five-step process, discussion, creating a criteria list, research, presentations, and then voting. And I guess it's really six steps because I then put it on a concert, but that's up to choice for the director. So with discussions, before really doing anything, I would take some class time with my students and talk about what constitutes good programming. What do we like about music? What sets a good piece of music apart from something maybe that isn't as good? And we also talked about our ability level, both as an ensemble and as an individual. And I included myself in that process. Even though I'm not playing with them, I might say, well, as a clarinet player, I really struggle with higher range notes. I can play anything low, but when I have to go above the, above the staff, it's not my favorite. So that would be something I have to work on kind of to get them comfortable talking about areas of development that they might have. And having those conversations helps them, one, to understand this process, how we find repertoire, how we pick what's good and what maybe isn't as good, and also how we look at ourselves. Should I be picking a grade four piece when my ensemble plays grade two? Probably not. Should I pick a piece where it's a trumpet feature and I only have two trumpets that maybe aren't confident for something like that? You know, really getting into the nitty gritty of what do we need to work on? Where are we at? And what do we like as an ensemble? And taking just a little bit of each class not one whole class, just a couple minutes each day and talking about some of those things. 
So then once we did that, we would make a criteria list together of what are we looking for when we're looking for a piece of music? If I sent you off to go find something, what do we need? So that list could have, you know, those checks for quality. Uh, that could be, is it repetitive? Is it not repetitive? Does it feature more than one instrument? Does it not? Whatever we decided together, it's a collaborative effort talking about the grade level, you know, I as a high school student did not understand what grade five meant. So when we brought a grade five piece to our director, he went, well, we can try, <laughs> but this might not be the best choice. So just telling them, hey, this is what this means. We should look for grade whatever or letter M for medium, mm -hmm. you know, just giving them intel on that, maybe where they should look. I, again, as a high school student, didn't know where to find music. I didn't, ex I wasn't expected to know that. So I didn't expect my middle schoolers <laughs> to know that either. So giving them, you know, a list of places to go, performance time, really whatever you're looking for, just giving them that list and making that list together. So you're not sending them into this process blind. Right. And then research, going in and saying, all right, you take two class periods, one class period, whatever you can give and go look go find something that matches this list. And I let students either work independently. There are many students who like that independent time. I was not that person. I needed to be with my friends. So also giving that group choice too, and just sending them off to look up some pieces, see how it matched that list, and then selecting one that they thought would be something we could play and not just could play, but should play in our ensemble. I also tell people a lot when I talk about this, if you think your students might need a check-in, like, hey, what piece did you pick? Can I see it before we move <laughs> forward? I don't know everybody's students. I needed that for some of mine. So I said, hey, when you find it, come show me and I'll just make sure this really crosses them all off. And they did, but sometimes you just want that <laughs> feeling of comfort and knowing you saw what they picked and it's going to work. And then presentations, it's something I think we don't get to do a lot in our classrooms, having students present for their peers. You might be able to do some like small ensemble concerts or things like that, but really we're usually just rehearsing. We're in our rehearsal setting and that's it. So giving students a chance to speak about music and working on those communication skills, I think is really important. And it wasn't crazy. I, they could do whatever they wanted. They could make some Google slides. I had some students do a skit. They could make a, a iMovie video, which some did. That's above and beyond. <laughs> that was great too, <laughs> using the music and making a little movie out of it. Or they could just go up and talk to their peers. I really was up to them. It just needed to be a presentation to convince their peers that their piece was the best one. And that took form in a lot of different ways. And I think allows for some student creativity in mm -hmm. that format, which was great. And then uh, voting, I allowed students to vote. I had no say because I looked at all the pieces in advance, I knew they would work. Um, so I, it was not my choice. We said, all right, here are your 15 pieces. Let's narrow it down to five. Mm -hmm. Let's narrow it down to two. Okay, now we're gonna vote between these two um, and whatever the students picked, that's what we played. And because again, I looked at them all, we knew it would work, but <laughs> it allowed for full student choice. I had no say in any of it, which I think was really fantastic. And you can vote however you want. We did um, ballot voting or like a Google form. Now that we're all in this technological age, Google forms are great, tallies it all there for you. Um, just so students don't feel pressured with hand raising and their friends elbowing them or looking at them across the room, <laughs> just a little bit more anonymous. And then that last step, like I said, uh, I allowed students to perform that piece based on our lives right now. You know, I'm, I don't have any performances scheduled just with my current situation. So maybe this year might not be a possibility for a lot of folks, but next year, future years, you could perform it live. You could maybe get the rights to do a virtual recording or you could just rehearse it and that's still great too, that students had a choice in what they were playing. But if you do get a chance to program it, I loved having students introduce the piece. I said, hey, here are my four talented scholars that found this piece. 
here, they're going to introduce it to you. And they talked about why they like it, what their family should listen to or listen for, what they, what they loved about it and why they wanted to play it. And it was a really great way to celebrate their involvement in that process and really take ownership of what they did. So it's a little bit of a long, long summary, yeah. but those five or six steps, just taking the time to implement each one with the students and really engages them into that process. But that's what, yeah, that's what makes it so successful. I think some people think, oh, student selected repertoire, just give them the JW Pepper website and let them have at it. And, and you're right. That's where they are going to have some problems and, and you never know what they might come back with. But the fact that you're, you're guiding them through those steps. It, I think is what makes it so powerful and successful. That's awesome. Yeah, and I, I love too that I think sometimes when I start a project like that, to me, it just seems so, it seems too big. And then I get overwhelmed with like, what am I gonna do? It's gonna be chaotic, it's gonna be crazy. But you outline so nicely, like your must haves, you know, like I'm not comfortable not knowing what they're gonna vote on. So I need to see it. And then, but they were happily like, okay, here's our piece, you know, and then you could, have that in that conversation with them if if you really worried it was going to be you know the wrong way to go but like in the end it didn't matter what they chose um so that's so awesome and it, it was really lovely how you explain like i could i feel like i could see your kids what they were doing and what some of the benefits of, of this whole thing is but were there any hidden benefits that you didn't really expect would happen that you know you that come out of this yeah, I, I think what you're talking about, like the student, you can see the students engaging in this learning. That's the number one benefit. And I think everybody can recognize that student-centered learning is great. Just the fact that they're collaborating, uh, they're developing their voice, they're learning to work together. They feel like their voice matters, all really important things. And when I talk about this for presentations, we really dig deep into the educational psychology of that. But mm -hmm. We, we get that, I think, as educators, putting students in the driver's seat can really propel them in their learning. I think there were a couple of ones that I necessarily wasn't prepared for, and I'm glad that I learned about them. In, in general, just engagement. You know, we always talk about how can I get my students engaged? And oh my gosh, especially in this virtual world, how can I get their cameras on? How can I get them to talk to me? I'm just so lost. This is something that now moving forward, I feel really comfortable using and it gives students that voice again in what they're learning that usually heightens their motivation and their engagement a little bit, at least just a little that they had to say rather than me saying, all right, we're going to play this piece. It's like, no, here's your piece that you picked. Mm -hmm. Let's rehearse it. And then it continue to engage them in that process of, okay, what do you hear in your piece that definitely increases their motivation and engagement. But the really kind of off the wall ones I wasn't prepared for was just our relationship building. Mm -hmm. I, I watched them do this project, but I was involved with it too. And what like getting involved with their research, asking them what they were finding. I learned more about what they like, mm -hmm. even in music, but kind of going beyond that, talking about, oh, this sounds like this movie, mm -hmm. or I feel like I heard this in this TV show. Oh, you like that? okay, now I know I can talk to you about that kind of just very small little relationship building moments that I wasn't expecting to have. And also them learning about their repertoire selection pro process. Mm -hmm. That's not a conversation we have just in passing with our students. Usually it's just, again, here's a piece that I picked for us. Let's play it. Now they understand, oh, this is what Ms. Johnson had to go through when she found our piece. Oh, maybe I shouldn't just immediately dismiss something we're playing because there's probably a reason that she picked it. So just walking them through that really helps them understand, oh, this is the process. This is how we get here. And also gave me repertoire that I had never heard of before. I am not an expert by any means about repertoire, especially middle school band repertoire. There's a lot out there that we have to sort through. And they were coming back with these pieces that I was like, oh yeah, okay, I would play this, this is good. So I ended up making like a list of all of these pieces that I still have with me because we can't play them all. <laughs> but I kept that with me and I'm like, man, you all help me expand my knowledge of repertoire too. So that for me was the number one of just 
you are teaching me, which I love those moments when they teach us instead of it's just us to them. Yeah. And I think honestly that they like it too. I think they find that to be pretty powerful when they have shown the teacher something new. That's pretty cool. So have you had any challenges throughout this process? Things that, that maybe you weren't expecting that you had to overcome? Yeah, I think the most significant one, which I actually, I love that this was a challenge is that students became very attached to the pieces that they found or that they picked. Mm -hmm. They were very emotionally invested because they went through that process and they put in the work to find it. So if you're only picking one piece like I did and you had 15 to choose from, that's 14 groups of students that might have their feelings hurt because mm -hmm. their piece wasn't picked. And that's valid. That's so valid and it's important to talk about with them. So with as a lot of things that come up in our jobs, I used that as a teachable moment. And we mm -hmm. had those conversations, a, a couple of them about, you know, this is how I feel when I pick music for you all, you know, I get invested. And so now you understand that when I put things in front of you, I care about it and I want you all to like it. And so just having the conversation from my perspective, but also telling them, you know, I understand how you feel, but I'm also so happy that you are this excited and passionate about making music together. Your feelings are valid, but I also love that you are feeling so passionate about that. So giving them that space and understanding that their feelings are valid, but also celebrating that they're having feelings about making music. And I also, like I was talking about earlier with kind of stealing their pieces for my own <laughs> list in the future, I used it as an opportunity for their pieces to make an impact on future years and told them about that. I said, you know, your piece, it didn't get picked, but I love it. And I love it for this, this, and this. So I'm going to add it to my to perform list. And who knows, some student somewhere, maybe it's here, maybe it's somewhere else, is going to play this piece and it's because you found it. It's because Aww. you put in the time to find this piece, to do the work, and you are going to make an impact on somebody else. And so showing students, you know, that impact they can have, I think, lessens the weight <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> of, right. Okay, well, we didn't get to play it, but maybe somebody else will. And just showing them again, their voice matters, their feelings matter, and they can make a difference. It did help a little bit, but you know, just being prepared to have those <laughs> conversations about, oh yeah, I'm really sorry, but we have to keep moving forward. Yeah, I like that. Well, you've lined out kind of how you do this so well. So, but is there any more advice you would give somebody who is like gonna just start out for the first time and give it a try? What, what advice would you give them? Yes, absolutely. Prepare. Like you were saying, <laughs> it, it's, it seems like such a, like a daunting thing and it, it can be, you know, if I just walked into that job and said, first day, okay, we're going to do this project. It would not have gone well. You know, I took a full year to do this, starting in the fall with getting to know those students, having those discussions. It took quite a long time. We didn't perform that piece they picked until the spring. So I took a lot of time on my own to prepare, make sure they had you know, knowledge of what quality music was, how I make choices, like we said before, their ability level. I knew that they had the knowledge to take that into our project. I also made sure logistically that I had a list of places that I could purchase music from, from the school. I know that varies school to school. Some schools have complete freedom and they can just purchase from whoever. Some schools, it's very limited to one or two vendors. So making sure that I worked with my administration beforehand. So in case some student picked a piece, I didn't have to come back to them and say, oh, I'm so sorry, we can't buy it. That would have been a heartbreaking thing for a lot of students and for myself. So just preparing in that way too. And also I talk about in my presentations a lot, assessing and grading. That's a huge part of our jobs, sometimes as much as we don't like it or want to do it, but knowing how you'll assess your students and letting them know too. Just with everything I normally do, I give my students a rubric beforehand, not after, so they know, okay, Ms. Johnson's going to grade me on 
my presentation on these things. She'll grade my research on these things. So they can kind of use that as a guide as they go. And just having a plan with what you're gonna do with it. Are you performing it? Are we just rehearsing it? Are we saving it for later? So really largely just prepare, just like with anything <laughs> we do, have a plan or a somewhat of a plan and then you can be flexible as we go. But preparation's key. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I, again, I think your steps just so nicely outline how somebody could implement it. So that's really perfect. All right, so slightly different topic. This has been a very unusual year, right? Yes. Is there anything that you've done in the last year that something different that you've tried, something that you've learned that you will carry out and continue doing in the future? Yes, absolutely. I think this year has changed us all in so many ways and it's changing our field in a lot of ways too. Um, I am taking a phrase from this year that I've kind of been keeping to myself, but just we have time is my short three word phrase that I'm using a lot this year because I don't know about you all. I feel like I'm not alone in that how I was brought up in this field was you got to push. You got to go towards assessment. You got to go towards district, towards state, towards this performance, that concert. You are just constantly pushing towards these big goals. And these goals are great. And I wanna have these concerts and these performances. That's not what I'm saying. But that push that we keep putting on ourselves and on our students, it leads to all of the stress, which is a whole other conversation. We could talk about self-care and stress <laughs> for a whole other hour, yeah. but uh, it leads to that stress, those feelings of anxiety, frustration. And without some of these big you know, districts, assessments, I've found myself having time to do a lot of things. But the number one thing for me is social emotional learning and putting a lot of SEL content into my classes and realizing I can take five minutes of my class to do something SEL related and still have more than enough time to get a musical concept learned, to get some measures of our music rehearsed to do whatever the goal is that day, that taking five minutes of our day to do something like that is not detrimental. In fact, it's beneficial. Yeah. So I just, I wasn't brought up that way. I, I think in my education and in my careers and jobs and internships and everything, it just, it seemed like we have to go, we have to go. We're behind, which I still hear this year. And again, I could talk about that for 30 more minutes, but I just hear we're behind, we gotta go, we gotta do this. And instead we should just take some time to do whatever it is you need to do. But just getting to know students through SEL check-ins and activities has made my job so much more fulfilling, made our relationships so much stronger that that's completely my plan moving forward, just to take five minutes, do a check-in, ask how they're doing, Last week I asked them how they eat their Oreos and it was a great debate that we had. <laughs> like, you know, it's okay, we can be goofy. We can get to know our students and not have to push so hard every day. Yeah, no, I think you, we, we skip steps when we do that, you know, because we, we're so worried about the end instead of the process, which I think most of us would say it is more about the process than the product and the concert. And yet we get so stuck in the, the end product. So yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> and it's clear from everything you've talked about how important the relationships are. And I think that's just, just so valid in our field. Yeah, absolutely. Well, how can people connect with you? Sure. I, uh, I have a very common name, so you can try to find me on Facebook. I'm from Minnesota. Listen, I had like five Laura Johnsons at my undergrad. We got each other's mail. It was a time. So you're welcome to try and find me on Facebook. But if you can't find my personal Facebook page, I also co-founded Women Banding Together, which is a group centered on the mentorship of women band directors, people that mentor women band directors or up and coming women band directors. So we have a Facebook page and we have all of our contact info there, including my website, my personal email. If you connect with us there, then you'll be able to find me personally through that. So one of those two options. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today and tell us about this process of student selecting repertoire and just 
how important it is. And I don't want to say it's easy because obviously it's not easy, but it's something that we can all do. Absolutely. Something that, that everyone can implement. So this is great. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful. Of course. All right. Thanks again. Thanks for joining us. Make sure you subscribe below. And follow us on social media. I'm at Musical Teresa. I'm Singing Finch One. And you can follow the hashtag Pass the Baton Book.